I'm Chris Farrell, and this is On Watch. Welcome to On Watch, everybody, the Judicial Watch podcast, where we go behind the headlines to report on matters that the mainstream media would really rather you not know about. We try to recover some lost history, and we try to explain the inexplicable. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you and welcome to the show. If you're watching us in the streaming version of this, you're listening to us on the audio version on Spotify or any of the other platforms out there, just know that we appreciate your time. We ask you to please subscribe, leave us a rating, and also communicate with us. You can write to info at judicialwatch.org and give us your ideas of what you want us to cover, who you want us to talk to. We value your input and your time, so thanks again. Today, we are going to strike fear in the hearts of the mainstream media and much of the liberal left, because on the same screen at the same time, Judicial Watch is going to engage with Breitbart, and that the two of us together <laughs> is probably made giving people anxiety attacks and chest pains and all kinds of other problems. But I'm very pleased and honored uh, to have joining us today the editor-in-chief of Breitbart, Alex Marlowe. Welcome, Alex. Chris, great to be with you. I'm such a big fan of Judicial Watch for many years, so uh, it's it's high time we finally did this. This is great, and uh, I'm serious. I'm sure that there's people sitting there clutching their chests saying, my God, it's Judicial Watch <laughs> and Breitbart in, in combination, same time. Blood, same blood pressure is going up all over the place. <laughs> it's a great thing. Uh, Alex, uh, you have been really Breitbart before Breitbart. You, you've been, you were the the... the uh, you know, uh, partner with an assistant or, or kind of the, the, the go-to guy for Andrew Breitbart and, and have, have seen it from the initial concept all the way through to today. It's, it's quite a story arc. Can you kind of walk us through and give us the, the, the Breitbart history and, and your critical role in, in what it is today? Sure. It's just one of those uh, three-hour podcasts where we just do the <laughs> wide-ranging light, conversation. Light no, topic. It, 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 this really should be a book. I mean, if uh, my agent's listening, um, this would be this would be a good one. Um, no, but it's it's a great it's a great question because Breitbart started from the most humble beginnings possible. It was truly one man in a dream, and uh, Andrew, who was a longtime editor of the Drudge Report and had actually helped Ariana Huffington start the Huffington Post. His idea for that was pretty genius. He saw that Ariana, who he had done research for her, had all these crazy left-wing friends, and he thought that she should uh, collect them all into one place, have them give their crazy opinions, and he thought the left would love it, and then the right would use it as talk radio fodder. So <laughs> he would all make fun of them. So, I mean, th that was the type of brain that Andrew had. So he was a true, true genius. Yeah. Um, and he partnered up with his longtime best friend from childhood, Larry Solov, who's still our CEO, is a great guy, and uh, knows Andrew better than anyone. And uh, he said to Larry, "Do partner from your law firm and let's change the world. And uh, they certainly did. And so their first employee was me. And I was a student at UC Berkeley. And Andrew and I were basically neighbors. Uh, we both grew up in West LA. We both lived in West LA. And uh, we had the, the California roots. So we had the conservatism running through our veins, but we also uh, had this background where we'd lived inside the belly of the left in Los Angeles. And we had all the same interests, music, baseball. So uh, it was a, an obvious match. Um, and so then we embarked, the three of us, and then our first employee was John Nolte, who I'm sure anyone who's read a single article online over the last 15 years has read some of John's stuff. Uh, it was it, Nolte was on a card table, and then it was me, Andrew, and Larry, and Andrew's basement. And that was the whole operation for the first, I don't know, close to a year, maybe more than a year. That was it. And Andrew famously borrowed, I think, $25,000 from his dad to get things going. And that was the origins of, of Breitbart. And we right. started blogging group blogs where Andrew would leverage his Rolodex of all of these people from Hollywood and politics that he had met from being a social butterfly and from working at Drudge. So he is just the most unbelievable list of contacts you could ever imagine. I still have in my phone thousands and thousands of names. And he would get them to volunteer their writings and their opinions to Andrew. 
And that was sort of how we operated until one day James O'Keefe walked in to Andrew with these tapes of this organization called ACORN, which I'm sure is very familiar <laughs> to Judicial very Watch. Very familiar, yes, um, indeed. Yeah, ACORN, for, for me in California, I had known them for the most hilarious uh, type of, of just political malfeasance possible, which is that they were campaigning out in California to raise the minimum wage. But the minimum wage laws that were already in place, the current minimum wage, were so onerous, they asked for a dispensation for the current minimum wage so they could hire more people to campaign to raise the minimum wage. That's the type <laughs> of people who are running ACORN. And James had them all busted um, trying to help him start a child sex trafficking business, um, which, is, which is really what it was. People kind of don't describe it that way, but that is it. He was That's a child exactly sex trafficking right. business. Yep. He and Hannah Giles, yeah, had pitched that. And all but one of the ACORN offices they'd gone to had volunteered to help and help them get government money to do that. And so uh, what James, James had gotten ACORN. But Andrew, with his rollout strategy, his drip, drip, drip approach that we all use now, um, he got the media because he got the media to act as though there's all this missing context, that this was just a one off thing and just one crazy person who's making this mistake. No, Andrew proved all that wrong. Andrew got the media to go so far out on a limb defending Acorn and then boom, another tape. They do it again. Boom, another tape. And then we had a business because we saw that this combination of Andrew's genius media strategy and his, his public persona, um, that in concert with whatever's going on in the news and his news knows was the best of anyone in the world, uh, that, that that was a business model. And that was the first iteration of Breitbart. And I, I know that's a long uh, intro, but that was where it started. And then we went to the to Wienergate. Um, Andrew eventually passed away tragically at 43. Steve Bannon came in and uh, me and Steve, and we were on the very cutting edge of the, the Trump wave and the populist movement. Um, our border and cartel coverage uh, was by far the first to identify the crisis at our border yep. in 2015. That's true. Um, and the, the Mylar blankets, the, the tinfoil blankets that went viral, that, that was all Breitbart's reporting. And here we are today, still going strong, one of the strongest conservative outlets, period. And um, I'm so grateful for everyone in the audience who's shown us support over the years. So what is Breitbart now? Give us in, in, the, uh, in the news media environment, where does Breitbart fit? What, what, what is its yeah. characteristics? How is it different from fill in the blank? Give me a, your sense for what the... It's uh, charism is. We, where, where does it exist? Sure. Yeah. So I, I think that one of the ideas for Breitbart that Andrew had, that I think is sort of underrated in, in our history, is he did want Breitbart to ultimately be a newswire for conservatives, uh, where if you're a conservative and you just want to know what's going on or and you don't want the AP's <clears throat> filter and you want the New York Times filter, where do you get your news? Like, where do you figure out? who showed up which place and talked to who about what and what was the essence of what they were talking about. Right. And that's one of the things that we do now that I'm very proud of is that if you look at our headlines over the course of a day uh, at Breitbart versus any other outlet in the world, I think you're going to be more informed from our headlines than any other outlet. And I, I put that up against the Wall Street Journal, against Fox, it's whatever's your favorite. I think we cover the most ground in terms of news with topic selection bias for a conservative perspective. In incredibly accurate. We are held to the most ridiculous standard when it comes to accuracy. First of all, internally, we hold ourselves to that standard. But second of all, there is this whole uh, industry of Soros funded, uh, establishment media funded fact checkers that are on our case whenever we make the slightest mistake. So we've looked at that as a challenge. OK, bring it on. Fine. Come get us because we're accurate on everything. So we are meticulous in terms of our detention, attention to detail when it comes to facts and comes to reporting the news. That's the thing we do best. Um, other things we do, though, is we have a great time. Uh, I do think that we, if you go to our front page, you're going to find jokes, you're going to find things to be outraged over, you're going to find things to laugh about, and you're going to have, I, I see the news media as truth-telling first, but a very close second is entertaining. 
And this comes directly from Andrew. And we try to have make sure that our audience is having a great time uh, when they're consuming the news. So I think if that's your perspective, you should have the Breitbart app and you should be refreshing it all day because you're going to get the cutting <laughs> edge in terms of what conservatives are thinking um, and what is going to resonate. But also, you're going to be entertained while you're there. You're not going to be bored by our stories. They're fast-paced. They're as tight as possible. And we want to keep people excited about the news because we're excited about the news. We think this is an incredibly exciting time to be alive and an incredibly exciting time to be an American. So you face challenges, obviously. You, you know, you've, yeah. you've, you've come under the microscope. You've been critiqued by the sort of establishment uh, media people out there. Uh, I was very fortunate for about a five-year period to teach journalism law at George Mason University out in Fairfax. Nice. And uh, I was a disruptor uh, <laughs> in that environment, you. As, as you might imagine. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me, as you might imagine. Um, and, uh, you know, I was always trying to express to people about, you know, the conventional media and what they're sort of, what, what drives them. Um, you what what was the impact you know we've all seen the twitter files right and we've seen how the government sure. went out of its way to suppress and censor and control and shape media what was the impact what was your takeaway lesson from this full scale head on stalinist move uh and really kicked off by covid actually the combination i guess of the 2020 election plus covid you put those things together and you still had to kind of punch your way through that. What, what kind of a lesson or what kind of a, a, a takeaway did you experience corporately? I mean, you're, you're the editor in chief. You're looking at this experience yeah. and you're saying, OK, what do we got to do to overcome this? Right. So Breitbart really was the guinea pig for the left in terms of censorship. Of course, we showed up in the Twitter files as being one of the entities that, that were censored. I mean, I, I think most reputable conservative outlets did at, at some level. So uh, we were in that group, and um, but we had become used to it um, because something happened in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump is that big tech started to understand and the left-wing radicals who are the activist base that drives the Democrat Party, they started to understand the impact of conservative media, particularly Breitbart, because we were the biggest. Um, and I, we, we probably still are, at least on the web, we're, we're, we're the biggest. Um, but it's the, there, there are others who do other formats that are you know, either TV or podcast. Stuff. Right. But in terms right. of web news, we're, 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 we're the biggest. And, uh, but what was happening in 2016 is we were getting to the level of the New York Times. And Facebook, if you look at the top three publications from the 2016 election in terms of political content, it was the New York Times, Breitbart, and Huffington Post. And depending on what metric, you know, one, two, or three, right. we were arguably number one, worst number three. Okay, and so big tech is 100% Democrats. It is a single party town, Silicon Valley. They only want Democrats to win. And they're looking at this and they see that their gal, Hillary Clinton, loses. And this rabble rousing outsider, Donald Trump wins. And now they're seeing this odd data point that this website they would never go to in a million years and they think is so disreputable and so horrible is now contending with the New York freaking times. <laughs> they're thinking that is never going to happen again, right, ever. Right. So they got to work and they got to work, not just suppressing our content on the web, which they do. Uh, and the worst offender by a mile is Google by a mile. Sure. Google cut off all Breitbart traffic completely before the 2020 election. And I document this a lot. I've got, um, I, I'm, I'm doing an advertisement for my second book. My first book, Breaking the News, New York Times bestseller. I document all, all the details of this, uh, where I go into specifically how Google turned off Breitbart's traffic and how you can't get Breitbart stories unless you type in the word Breitbart. Right. When you're searching for Google, original breaking news, interviews with world leaders, interviews with cabinet secretaries, you cannot get it unless you type in the word Breitbart. So we've been dealing with this on so many fronts for so long. And then what happened is it's not just tech suppression. It's the advertisers. Then there was this network that popped up of left wing uh, uh, radicals who were trying to toxify our brand with advertisers so then we couldn't make money, we couldn't grow. Uh, and we were so big, we were able to survive. But it did disrupt the business model, not just for Breitbart, 
but for the entire media. If yeah. you see all these stories of hundreds of layoffs in the sure. news media, all of this is because of these left-wing radicals trying to take out Breitbart. That's where it came from. They failed at taking us, us, uh, taking us out. But what they did is they, they reset the mind frame of publishers across the country to think that we don't necessarily want to put our advertisement against COVID content, against war content, against any sort of polarizing content because the advertisers don't like it. And that created a huge sea change in the news media and it caused countless outlets to go out of business and thousands of jobs to be lost, all in an effort to take out us and we're still standing. So yesterday in front of Congress, and I'm sure that you at least kind of dipped into it and got some highlights. Maybe you watched the entire thing, I don't know. But uh, two friends of mine, uh, professional colleagues who I've dealt with for years, but also personal friends, people that I know, I know them, I know their families, testified in front of Congress, Cheryl Atkinson and Katherine Herridge. And I'm not sure if you heard or saw their testimony, but I think there's some pretty harsh uh, lessons there. I mean, can, do you have a little comment or kind of overview on, on what Atkinson and Herridge presented in front of Congress yesterday? Yeah, I, I had my team follow that closely for me uh, yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to focus on it completely. But I would love to get your your take, and, and you, you, you can let it roll, because I, I got the top line notes. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I think the key thing is that Herridge came in, and of course she's a witness in a Privacy Act uh, case where a uh, female uh, educator, I'll use that term loosely, who had contracts with the DOD, who also apparently was a colonel in the People's Liberation Army of China, uh, she did reporting on that and how the FBI had investigated her. Well, now she was a witness to this thing and she's subpoenaed and she doesn't want to turn over her sources. She says no. And in the process of that whole saga, which is now you know years long litigation, uh, CBS fires her, grabs her notes, shuts down her office, doesn't give her access. She says she, that in journalistic terms, she felt raped. And uh, you know she's yeah. a, she's a great peril now. She's been cut off from CBS, so the job's gone, the healthcare's gone, the you know er she's at zero, right? And her own kid came to her and said, "Mommy, are you going to go to jail?" because a, a, judge yeah. is, a judge has found her in contempt, and it's an $800 a day fine for not complying. And then Cheryl Atkinson comes in, and she, of course, she was subjected to similar treatment by CBS, different but similar. And uh, Atkinson has a, her own set of experiences. I used to have her as a guest lecturer in my class, and she talks about you know how, how the news media is shaped, and the, she has a great piece on a, a TED Talk about astroturfing you know news content and anyway they both gave great testimony that i think is an yeah. accurate representation yeah, and, and, of and today. From, from from my team's perspective everyone was just even at breitbart where we're used to people attacking us for reporting facts uh, which is and trying to take business from us I, it is still pretty shocking to see someone of her caliber testify that because she's trying to just do her job that right. she's trying to be compelled to uh, uh re reveal confidential sources to the point where she's locked out of the building right and hundreds of pages of her reporting and her files are being seized i mean being treated like she's a criminal that Correct. she's an enemy of the state because she dares to report on stuff that maybe some of her colleagues don't like yeah and i don't think of her as some sort of a right-wing radical like it's the maybe i'm wrong i don't know her no, I, no. I've she's, never met her she's before, straight up and down journalistic, yeah. you know, for real, old school, right? Right. And uh, and I think that's the thing that shocks people is both Atkinson and Herridge are old school, straight up reporters, didn't give a damn which way it, the story broke, just I'm no. gonna I'm gonna dig and get facts and you may not like it, but I'm gonna give it to you straight. And and that made people always respect them, but it also made people, editorial people at CBS freak out. So, so my, my take on this is that what they're trying to do is they're trying to criminalize being a conservative. And Correct. this is happening throughout the government, uh, and this is happening throughout the media and throughout the legal system. Um, we just saw yesterday as we're recording this with the 
uh, subpoena of Leonard Leo. Now, uh, people who are in the know in Washington know uh, Leonard Leo is on one hand the most important conservatives in the country. Uh, this is a incredibly smart, incredibly accomplished attorney who's co-chair of the Federalist Society, uh, but he is one of the ultimate uh, organizers of conservatives, one of the most powerful guys, and a stand-up guy. And so because of that, because he's a smart, powerful, conservative stand-up guy, uh, they're subpoenaing him in what I believe is an illegal way and challenging him to defy the subpoena. And now we're seeing when you're defying subpoenas, now that could be a jail sentence for you. Yeah, I mean, look, look at Peter, now, Peter, Peter Navarro. He, yeah, Peter Navarro, 72-year-old PhD from Princeton, is being treated like he's some kind of a, you know, a homicidal maniac and he's dragged That's off to exactly jail. That's right. and, and, exactly right. And Dick Durbin, of all people, one of, I mean, one of the most corrupt operators on Capitol Hill. Dick Durbin, as chair of the Judiciary Committee, is going after Leonard Leo. I mean, Durbin isn't qualified to shine Leo's shoes. Uh, sure, of course. So, I mean. Well, th th this, re this reminds me of, you know, Joe Biden going after a Judge Bork and a Clarence Thomas. I mean, he was a jo Joe Biden barely survived law school. And now all of a sudden he's the guy who's, you know, he, he's he was the person who was in charge of vetting Supreme Court picks, which is completely absurd if you think of it <laughs> that way. And yeah. yet that's exactly what happened in our country. Yeah. And so but if you think about this, you think about the overreaction of January the 6th. I'm not saying January the 6th was nothing, but the wild overreaction to it. Correct. Uh, you look at the lawfare against President Trump. You look at the lawfare against Leonard Leo. Uh, you look at what's happened to Katherine Harrod, Sheryl Atkinson, et cetera. Uh, you look at what happens even to entities like Breitbart. It is the act of being a conservative and having a conservative nonprofit, the act of having conservative journalism outlet, the act of being a conservative and trying to uh, dismantle even small portions of the deep state. That is a criminal offense to the people in power. And even if they don't get away with it this time, you know what it does, Chris? It intimidates the next generation of smart conservatives. Correct. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm just I'm going to go to Wall Street or I'm going to go be a lawyer. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to live a peaceful life. I'm not going to deal with all these all, all these people. Correct. And that's what I'm most afraid of, is that that's the effect it's going to have. And that's exactly what they desire. It's a chilling effect. It's a it's an attempt to push people out of the box. They, they, would, they don't even want to get involved. Forget about taking a leadership position or advancing, you know, uh, some idea of being an activist or getting involved in public policy, they don't even want you playing in the box. You're pushed out of the sandbox altogether. And that's, that's what their goal is. You know, uh, that's right. Jack, Jack Smith, well our, our, our illustrious uh, you know, supreme investigator and prosecutor, he's gone completely out of his mind because Tom Fitton uh, talks about how the, the Presidential Records Act gives President Trump full authority to take any records he wants. And the reason we know that is because we litigated the case, Judicial Watch did, and we lost. And Judge Amy Berman Jackson in the U.S. District Court said, the president has an absolute, unreviewable right to take any records or documents or things that he wishes, and everyone misses this part, and neither the Congress nor the National Archives can second guess him. That's yes. the law. That's that is the decided law. It has to do with Clinton and records that he took. And so it's a okay for Clinton to do it. And Judge Amy Berman Jackson's language is very strong and it's unequivocal. But when you take that same decision and apply it to Trump, all of a sudden everybody gets amnesia. What are you talking about? Wow. What are you talking Brilliant. about? What's this absolute yes. unreviewable authority? And how come, right? So we pointed that out, and Jack Smith is apoplectic. This guy, he is literally foaming at the mouth that we yes. have conveyed the historical facts of what our litigation experience was. He doesn't like that. We're not allowed to say that. And I mean, there, there's the yeah, chilling and, effect. And and this is where, if you want to talk about things that I'm, I'm concerned about as a country, uh, it is the criminalization of wrong speak, of having a wrong opinion. Right. Trying to make it as though you should be, you're not entitled to make an argument. You're not entitled to voice disagreement with the corporate status quo, with the media status quo, with the legal status quo. Uh, that's very dangerous because one of the things that has been the cornerstone of this country and why we've thrived is because we've been uh, respectful of people's opinions with whom we differ. 
and sometimes even insane opinions. That's the nature of free speech. If you're going to be a First Amendment crusader, you can't be pro-First Amendment for only people you agree with. So it's got to be the people who challenge you the most, the most, are the ones that you have to value their speech. And there is a at least 50% of the country now, it appears, who have completely not internalized that at all. And what I'm afraid of is if we're not talking, if it becomes illegal to express a opinion or an argument, then what happens next? What happens to people who feel like they cannot express their opinion? I'm very sensitive to this because this is just how I work things out uh, as a personal, as an individual. If I can't talk, I can't live. And that was something that America lived that as a whole. And so what happens when it is when the free speech goes away and is going away and it's being enforced, not just by the government, by by the corporations, as you, your Twitter files example is a perfect example. Right. Um, if this happens, then that could lead to violence. Now, I disavow all political violence, but you know who doesn't? The left, the Black Lives Matter crowd, For sure. the Antifa crowd. For sure. They don't. They don't. So uh, what happens when violence is precipitated and then people cannot fully express their opinions to work out the issues with our words, with our brains? Then it gets physical, and that is where the country is going to go to a very, very bad place and something we can't even picture. On the, on the way out of our talk here today, I want to touch on two things I want your opinion on. You may have already expressed it to one degree or another, but I'd like to sure. just kind of recap it clearly. Uh, two things. Number one, the biggest issue, what's, what is the biggest crisis facing this country right now? And then number two, what is the most underreported, neglected, off the radar screen? We're totally distracted with other stuff, but we really need to be looking at something else. Those two things. What do you think? Right. Well, perfect. So, so for the first one, I'll, I'll give a fairly obvious answer, but I still think is really important, uh, which is China. Um, China is, uh, it is, Joe Biden will not confront China. Uh, we've got 100,000 people every year dying from fentanyl, and China's involved at every single level. Uh, my friend Peter Schweitzer just wrote a, a, a terrific book called Blood Money, which details uh, all, everything about this, everyone should read it if you haven't already. Absolutely. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, why won't he confront them? And it's because of corruption. And it's because the Chinese government and Chinese connected entities, and not good guys, not stand up Chinese businessmen, people who are connected to all sorts of uh, dirty deeds, uh, are the ones who are funding the Biden family to one degree or another. And they are connected with one degree of separation at most, from the the drug trade, which emanates from China with fentanyl production, comes into Mexico, come, flows over our border, uh, to the Biden family. And these are not legit business guys. These are the shady dudes of the world. And that's why they're not being discussed, because the Biden family, if they were just doing legit deals, then they would report it in the New York Times. They would write, these are actually pretty legit, but they don't do that. And so the fact that we are uh, undercutting our energy sector. We're undercutting the combustion engine, the automotive industry to uh, promote EVs, which the green left loves and China loves it because China is better at making EVs than America. We're better at making the combustion engine. And you look at how the Biden family is getting loaded up with money from the Chinese. All of it starts to make sense. But what's happening is Americans are literally dying. And in the meantime, we're trying to make China rich with our government policies and the Biden family is getting rich. This is a story that this audience understands but I don't think that it is a widespread knowledge. And this is the story probably more than any other that I would like for your average voter who is just starting to tune into politics to figure out between now and election day and uh, l let them draw their own conclusions uh, that why a, a, a entities that gave Jim Biden, who is a nightclub manager, $100,000 and gave diamonds to Hunter Biden. I mean, th these are not good guys. And what they're doing is they're working with the cartels, the Sinaloa cartel in particular, to push the drug trade into America. And in the meantime, they got TikTok, which we're all addicted to, or all that our children are. ByteDance is making profit hand over fist, which is the TikTok parent company. And our kids are getting addicted. And this brings me to my, to my point, the really underreported thing that I think that no one is dealing with is our addiction to screens and our uh, phone-based life right. is really not good for people. I agree. And it's not good for, for teens in particular. They're getting depressed. Um, they are losing ambition. 
and they are essentially just wasting years of not experiencing the world and instead they have what i call scrolliosis which is scrolling and scrolling and scrolling right, there's right. no way to live and it's highly addictive and it is largely being pushed on us by big american corporations and by china two entities that i trust not at all and we're giving them this unfettered access to our brains, but in particular, young Americans' brains. And we've got to figure out a way to get to, to get that era to end. And it's not going to be easy, but we've got to figure it out. And what they really should be doing is reading the book that's over your shoulder, Breaking Biden. Tell us, tell us about Breaking Biden. Thank you. Yeah, so I, 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 it means a lot to have the plug. Thank you. Um, the I decided that... I didn't trust myself. I knew everything there is to know about Joe Biden. And I really wanted to get to the bottom of him because I feel like conservative media has made a mistake. I feel like we've uh, just taken Biden as some sort of a puppet that's been propped up by various entities and he's not really in charge and there's nothing to him. And I, I didn't accept that. So I took on the task, I gave myself the task of doing a deep dive. I spent 18 months researching him with a team of investigators uh, all of whom were past or present employees of, of Peter and Government Accountability Institute and, you know, the top investigators around. And I wanted to do a deep dive into Joe Biden's life. And what I concluded was that he is immeasurably worse in every metric imaginable. And the most important metrics and the ones to focus on as we head in uh, towards this very dramatic season we're in where there's so much on the line uh, is number one is the corruption. And I detail a fraction of the international deals the Biden family has gotten away with. And they occur in China, one after the next after the next, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, the Caribbean, uh, all, all over the world, they're, Iraq, they're making money on the back of Joe's name and the US government. These are people with no qualifications, they have no skills. What's for sale is access to Joe Biden. He is the product and the entire family's gotten enriched and America's policy has changed in many of these cases because of Joe Biden and Judicial Watch. You guys have done an amazing job reporting on a lot of this stuff, but there's so many details, some that I've unearthed that are new and many others that I hope to summarize for an audience that's just trying to understand what's going on. Um, but the extent of his policy failings are also kind of mind blowing when you lay them end over end and I, I which I've done plus an investigation in the various family members. These are not good people. These are uh, junkies and grifters. And Chris, that is not an attack or a pejorative. That is literal. Yeah, it's These just, people, it's just a the Biden family. It's just, it's just it's, a That's fact. who they are. Right, right. Exactly right. And I think having a reference point for people heading into this year, I think was important. And that's what I did. Um, and I think uh, people find it to be a fun read in a lot of ways, but uh, completely infuriating on every page. But hopefully it's important and hopefully it uh, picks up an even bigger audience than it already has. Yeah, it's a, it's a book that you uh, read and then you throw it across the room and then you have to get up and go get it and <laughs> pick it back up again and exactly. keep reading, right? It's, uh, exactly. Every, that, everyone, that, that is what it is. Everyone watching and listening, if you don't have a copy of Breaking Biden, uh, you're wrong. Go out and get a copy. Uh, you need to read Thank it. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, before we wrap up, uh, we've covered some really great ground. I think some really interesting topics that our viewers and listeners will enjoy. Uh, but I also want to give you uh, the last word, let you close out. Alex, if there's something I haven't asked you or something that you want to cover that I've missed or whatever, here's your, here's your chance. Take a shot at it. Uh, no, I, I think that's it. The Chinese organized crime and the way that it's infiltrated America uh, was, was the real thing I wanted to, to point out. And I guess I'll add that uh, what if it was the Russians who were doing this? And uh, Peter in his book, he does an amazing job, not just bringing the Biden family, but uh, Gavin Newsom and Adam Schiff, for example, financially, personally have associations and relationships with figures in Chinese organized crime. Uh, it's the, let me reiterate that. Gavin Newsom, who could be president in four years, uh, Adam Schiff, who could be the next senator from California, have financially and personally benefited from their associations and relationships with Chinese organized crime. And no one seems to care in the establishment media this is happening. And I just ask, if it was Russia and if it was Republicans, would we know and would we care? We would. Of course we would. So it shows you just how broken the media is 
how important it is to support whichever conservative outlets and entities, nonprofits, et cetera, that resonate with you. Because we're the only ones who are trying to hold left-wing dark money accountable. And that's not just Chinese, it's also American too, Arabella advisors. Uh, people talk about money in politics. This is the biggest money in politics entity ever. And it's all fueling the political left. There's so much outrage over like the, the Coke network. Arabella Advisors dwarfs what the quote what the Cokes ever were. And this is who is running Democrat policy in America and thus running the country at this moment where Democrats are so dominant. And I feel like if so long as there's free speech, we can win. But free speech is under attack as well. So we have to move fast. We have to get fired up and we cannot get lazy. This is the year to be fired up, to band together, come home to wherever uh, wilderness you've been to. And we got to fight hard for the rest of this year. That is an incredibly strong and powerful closing point uh, for us to end this interview on. Okay, all you leftists out there, you can put your nitroglycerin tabs down. You survived. <laughs> you survived this episode somehow. Uh, accommodation, Breitbart, Judicial Watch, doubleheader, and uh, we look forward to doing this again sometime. Alex, thank you so much for your time. This has been a fascinating interview. Some really great topics covered. And most of all, we appreciate the excellent work that you and all of your colleagues at Breitbart are doing. You have our thanks. A feelings mutual. I can't thank you enough, Chris, and all of Judicial Watch. You have a terrific audience. Thanks again, Alex. I'm Chris Farrell on Watch. <laughs>